Finally, we look at temperature, which is the measure of heat energy available in the air and soil. This is known as the thermal environment. Temperature is recorded by a thermometer. There are two kinds of thermometers. A sheltered thermometer, which is the most common kind, the kind that we usually see in our house, which is a glass tube with some kind of mercury in it. The second is a thermograph. It's a cylinder with graph paper with increments for the 24 hours. Modern versions are digital, so there's no paper. When recording temperatures, it is useful to calculate the mean daily temperature, which is adding the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature and dividing by two. You can also calculate the mean monthly temperature in which we sum all the mean daily temperatures and divide by the number of days in the month. Then you can calculate the mean annual temperature, which is summing all the mean monthly temperatures and dividing by 12. Temperature scales are important to understand. Fahrenheit was proposed by physicist Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit in 1724. At this scale, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. Celsius was originally called centigrade and formulated in 1743. Anders Celsius developed a scale much like it, and the scale we use today was renamed to Celsius in 1948 in honor of him. In this scale, water freezes at zero, and water boils at 100. Converting from one scale to another is quite easy. For Fahrenheit to Celsius, you take five ninths and you multiply that by Fahrenheit minus 32, or another way, 0.55556 times Fahrenheit minus 32. For Celsius to Fahrenheit, you take nine-fifths times Celsius and then add 32. Or in other words, 1.8 times the Celsius plus 32. Oh, but wait, there is another scale. This scale is used in scientific research and is known as the Kelvin scale. It is an absolute thermodynamic temperature scale. Zero is absolute zero, or negative 273.16 degrees Celsius. The word degree is not used when referencing Kelvin. For example, water freezes at 273.16 Kelvin. The daily cycle of temperatures on Earth is related to its rotation. At sunrise, insulation begins. It reaches its maximum at noon and stops at sunset. However, there is a heat lag in which the maximum temperatures are reached mid-afternoon because the input insulation is continually added until the sun angle decreases enough for the output to overtake the input. The lowest temperatures of the day occur just before sunrise. Other variables which affect daily temperatures are 
cloud cover. Approximately 50% of the globe is covered by clouds at any given moment. During cloud cover, there are lower maximum temperatures and higher minimum temperatures. Differential heating of land and water, in which water cools and heats slowly, and land cools and heats rapidly. In the summer, water regions have cooler maximum temperatures, and in the winter, water regions have warmer minimum temperatures. And reflectivity or albedo also can control daily temperatures. Snow has an albedo of 95%. So we see, the higher the reflectivity, the cooler the region will be. Remember the environmental lapse rate where temperatures decrease with elevation? Well, sometimes it warms with increasing elevation. This is called a temperature inversion. They are most common with coastal areas. Smog in the Los Angeles Basin or frost in other areas are examples of results from temperature inversions. Heat islands are a phenomenon created by urban land use. Large parking lots with black asphalt absorbs a lot of solar insulation, creating very hot spots in that location. The annual cycle of temperatures are related to the Earth's revolution around the Sun, its tilt on its axis, latitude, and energy transfer. Gauging locations by their annual temperature ranges their highest monthly average minus their coldest monthly average. Here are some examples by latitude. Manus, Brazil has a temperature range annually of 3 degrees Fahrenheit. Aswan, Egypt, located at 23 degrees north, has an average annual range of 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Something more moderate would be like Manhattan, Kansas at 39 degrees north. It has a temperature range of 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Verkhoyansk, Russia at 67 and a half degrees north has the highest range ever recorded which is 183 degrees Fahrenheit for an annual temperature range. Proximity to oceans also determine the temperature ranges. It lowers the range. So if we took Earth's temperatures and we put them on a map, what would they look like? Well first, an isotherm is a line that shows equal temperature values. You see them on weather maps a lot. Their trend is that they're east and west oriented, with decreasing values toward the poles. The changes between the lines are smaller toward the equator, and they shift south to north from January to July. Here's some temperature extremes for the record books. The highest temperature ever recorded was 134.1 degrees Fahrenheit in Death Valley, California in 1913. Now, you will probably see some other numbers thrown around, but they're unconfirmed in which 136 was supposedly recorded in Libya and 152 degrees somewhere in China. The lowest temperature ever recorded was 
minus 128 degrees at Vostok Station in Antarctica in 1983. The largest two-minute rise of temperature was recorded at 49 degrees Fahrenheit in Spearfish, North Dakota in the United States in 1943. The record for a 24-hour temperature change is 103 degrees in Loma, Montana in the United States in 1972. This is the end of part two, by the way. Uh, I didn't do an introduction or an ending to part one. Since they were kind of together, this is Bubbles. He had to be part of this lecture series. But um, let me put him down. Well, that concludes chapter three, the Earth Radiation Balance. We talked a lot of stuff uh, a lot of numbers and a lot of terms that we talked about, uh, not as many animations, but um, I hope you enjoyed uh, learning about uh, the radiation balance. Uh, it's really, really important to understand the basics anyway as we move forward. Uh, it's really important to not really memorize all the numbers but just have general idea of the terms so i'm glad you came i'm glad you watched uh please continue uh to subscribe to my physical world um i'm ending on part two um, instead of part one since it's a continuation uh, but it's really really amazing the physics involved with the interaction with that great sun that great star that we have out there that's giving us energy and what it does to the earth and this information if you go over these terms over and over it's really going to help you understand a lot of things in the future but again thank you for coming for taking time out of your day and we'll see you next time in chapter four.